Hello everyone, my name is Kate and my partner's name is Melly and today we're going to be discussing the biomechanics of kicking a soccer ball. Um, we're mainly going to be focusing on what's occurring at the hip and the knee. We wanted to start first with a visual of an in-step soccer kick. Um, so here's a super quick video of the motion. Notice that Josh is going to take a ball, push it in front of him so he can step into it for strike on goal. His plant foot goes beside the ball, so that his toes are pointed to where he wants the ball to go, towards his target. His knees are bent, so he has good balance and flexibility. You'll notice then with his kicking leg, he's swinging from the hip with his toes down on his kicking foot, his ankle locked, so he gets a firm strike of the ball with his shoelaces, his in-step drive. Knees are bent, he's leaning slightly forward, his arms are out for balance, and to help him on his follow through, you see his follow through comes across his body. That's good, Josh. So that's the in-step drive. Okay, so we broke down that motion into five phases, and you can see that in the images to the right. Um, so our first phase is the approach, right? You can see that in the top image in A and the first one in the bottom image. The second phase is going to be your foot plant and your backswing. Um, so that is your planting in the image, planting your left foot and your right foot is swinging backwards to prepare for the kick. Um, and then our third phase is gonna be that leg swing. So your right leg swings forward to make contact with the ball, which is our fourth phase um, or image D in the top picture. Um, and then our fifth phase is gonna be the follow through. Um, so steps B and C or two and three um, kind of occur together and it likely depends on, a, on the athlete's skill or preference when doing um, this motion. The bottom image over here, um, it explains the limb motion that's going on during these five phases. The joint movements you see in this activity are extension, flexion, abduction, adduction, and plantar flexion. In the approach back swing, the hip is extending and your extensor muscles are contributing to that motion. Your hip is also going to abduct as you prepare to swing your leg forward. Your knee is flexing at this point in time and the flexor muscles contribute to that motion and your ankle um, is plantar flexed throughout the entirety of the motion. During limb swing and foot contact to the ball, your hip is flexing forward as you come in contact and it is beginning to adduct across your body. Your knee is extending and in the follow through, your hip is still flexing, but now your extensor muscles are contributing to this motion um, and your knee is extending, but the flexor muscles are contributing to this motion and that's to slow your limb down as you come to completion of this move. I just talked about the muscle groups that are activated during those joint movements. And I've listed more specifically what muscles those are and what muscles consist of each group here on the right. But I really wanna highlight um, this on the bottom left here that during the approach and the backswing, you are concentrically using your muscles um, because as you extend your hip, your extensor muscles are working to do that motion. Um, and during your limb swing and foot contact phases three and four, you are still concentrically activating your muscles because you are flexing your hip and your flexor muscles are active. As you're knee extends, your knee extensors are active. In the follow through, however, you are using eccentric muscle activity because as you are flexing your hip and extending your knee, your knee flexors become activated to slow down that activity and your hip extensors are activated to slow down the movement of flexion. The first biomechanical concept that we'll be talking about is angular velocity. When you approach the ball, 
Researchers have found that the optimal angle to do this is between 30 and 45 degrees. 30 degrees will give you the maximum velocity of the shank, and at 45 degrees, you'll get the maximum velocity of the ball. This will be based on athlete preference and skill. Summation of segmental velocities contribute to the angular velocity of the foot, which will then affect the velocity of the soccer ball during the kick. In backswing, phase two, the shank will move backwards and thigh angular velocity is smaller while the shank velocity is negative. As the leg swing comes forward, the shank moves forward, thigh angular velocity increases and you'll reach your peak value just before the knee begins to extend. The thigh will equal the shank velocity, and so the total knee velocity will be zero at this point. Another biomechanical concept we looked at was hip torque. Hip torque happens very differently throughout the different phases. Like in phase two, the foot plant and the back swing, it contributes to mostly hip extension and possible hip abduction. This can be seen in the top photo where the hip flexors are being stretched and the hip extensors are being used to create a more powerful kick. Whereas in phase three, the limb swing, phase four, the foot contact with the ball, and phase five, the ball throw all contribute to hip flexion. This can be seen in the bottom photo where the hip and thigh are being flexed forward in order to kick the ball. Hip torque is very important to analyze because it is assumed that flexion and extension and abduction and adduction torque of the hip joint will increase swing velocity and thus increase the foot velocity of the instep kick. I've also included a little diagram here to show that with the hip torque, most of it is used with flexion and extension, with some being used in adduction and abduction, like I explained earlier in the first, first photo, and very little in internal and external rotation. Another biomechanical concept we looked at was knee torque. Much like hip torque, it happens very differently in the different phases. Like in phase two, the foot plant and back swing, it contributes to mostly knee flexion. This can be seen in the top photo, where the knee is going backwards and beginning to flex in order to create a more powerful kick. Whereas in phase three, the limb swing, phase four, the foot contact with the ball, and phase five, the follow through, all contribute to knee extension. This can be seen in the bottom three photos. In C, her leg is bent slightly but it's beginning to extend. In D, it is almost flat on the ground and in contact with the ball. And in E, it is almost fully extended and has fully followed through with the kick. We found a study that specifically looked at male players with an increase in flexion and extension torque of the knee joint in the kick, it may effectively increase its swing velocity. Much like the last study, the flexion and extension is mostly used with the knee torque, although abduction and adduction are slightly used and internal and external rotation are hardly used at all. The final biomechanical concept we looked at was ground reaction forces. A lot of research on knee injuries have mainly focused on running, cutting, walking, and landing movements. This is because the majority of soccer injuries frequently occur while dribbling, cutting, or in a quick change of direction. Although, while the above movements are common and can be applied to multiple sports, the most important movement in soccer is the kick. This study looked at the ground reaction forces for a soccer kick with studded sole, walking, landing, a straight cut, a cross cut, running at 3.8 meters per second, cutting, starting, stopping, and drop jumping. The soccer kick had a greater vertical ground reaction force than walking, cutting, running, starting, and stopping, and less than the landing and the drop jumping. The soccer kick also had a medial ground reaction force that was greater than all the other movements. And the soccer kick had a posterior ground reaction force that was greater than all the other movements except for cutting. This is very interesting because we have done so many studies that have looked at running, cutting, and walking. It'd be interesting to see how injuries happen with the actual kick of soccer. In conclusion, this is beneficial because it allows us to better understand the biomechanical concepts used to create a more powerful kick and how different forces are used while performing actions on the field, such as cutting, kicking, and running. This impacts training by allowing us to begin teaching proper technique at a younger age. This impacts performance because the athlete needs to determine if leg swing velocity or ball velocity is more beneficial to the game when deciding on what angle to approach at. It also impacts performance because an increase in the torque at the hip and knee, especially with extension and flexion, would increase the swing velocity, creating a more powerful kick, allowing for a longer pass.
these are the references that we used in our PowerPoint. And I just wanted to say thank you for listening to our slideshow.